Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Mary Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Chris Agar, and I'm one of your three Ath Fellows for this year. For many, an important component of the American dream is economic freedom. Yet for the average Black household, under any definition of the term, this goal is less attainable than that of the average white household. As such, the nation's income inequality is also an issue of racial inequity. Yet there is no single consensus amongst economists on what economic freedom exactly means. Tonight's speaker, Professor Gary Hoover, will discuss different definitions of the term and the tangible impacts these various definitions have on inequality. Gary A. Hoover is Professor of Economics and Executive Director of the Murphy Institute at Tulane University. Before joining Tulane this year, he served as Professor and Department Chair of Economics at the University of Oklahoma, where he was also honored for his professional and scholarly work and for his teaching and mentoring skills. Hoover is a member and co-chair of the American Economics Association Committee on the status of minority groups in the economics profession. This group was established in 1968 to increase the representation of minorities in the economics profession, primarily by broadening opportunities for the training of underrepresented minorities. Hoover is the current and founding editor of the Journal of Economics, Race, and Policy, which examines the intersection of local and global issues concerning economic conditions, race, ethnicity, and gender, ethnicity and gender, and policy prescriptions that address economic disparities. He served as the vice president of the Southern Economic Association from 2018 to 2020. He has also contributed papers and have ha, papers that have been published in the American Economic Review, PMP, Journal of Economic Perspectives, Public Choice, Journal of Economic Literature, International Tax and Public Finance, Journal of Conflict Resolution, and the European Journal of Political Economy. Using the Q&A function, we will accept questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send in a question, please state your affiliation with the college. Student, faculty, parent, alumni, friend. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gary Hoover to the virtual afternoon. All right, thank you uh, very much, everybody. And I really am honored um, to be asked to present some of this uh, research that I've been doing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna talk to you about functionalization of this idea of economic freedom and what it can and cannot do to close the racial and income gaps that exist. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do is keep the work at the level to where I'm, I'm gonna avoid a bunch of jargon as much as possible. Uh, maybe a little bit will be thrown in there. Um, also gonna try and stay away from anything, equations and stuff like that. And really hopefully just let us all have a conversation. So, um, with that, once again, I want to say um, thank you. And I've been told that um, I can be invited back in person once we are post pandemic and that would be appreciative as opposed to me just sitting here in my, my kitchen. So does a rising tide lift all boats, racial and distributional aspects of economic freedom? Um, let's start talking a little bit. So what do we know? For several generations, we know that researchers have been really concerned about this gap in income. And here are some older data that is some 2015-16 data, which you see shows the gap in income being almost double. And it actually, during the pandemic, this number is actually um, double. So there's, there's this tremendous gap and the incomes of the median household for black families in the United States and the median household of white families in the United States. So what is that gonna mean? What is this difference in incomes going to translate into? It's going to translate into enormous differences in wealth, right? And so look at how this translates as we talk about wealth. So 
the median white household's wealth, $91,000. And remember, we're talking about, now these numbers are even a little bit older than the ones I showed you before. And here are the numbers for the median black household. When we're talking about wealth, really large numbers. And what does that mean? That means that what about transfers of wealth? So when you're thinking about intergenerational transfers, I want to be able to leave something to my children so that they can start off better than I did and then they want to do something for their children. Well, when you're starting out with numbers that are just this far apart, um, it really translates into a fairly large gap both in wealth, and this is what's leading to what we've seen. But the impacts don't actually end there. Um, here's the cost of the gap, not to just the poor households or the black households, but to all of us. You know, because we're in a society together, when part of the society, or in, in the case, uh, black households, when about 13% of the population is absolutely has a level of inequity, it translates into what? This racial wealth gap, the one I was just showing you before, would translate, if we were to work on closing that gap, it would translate into about $6.8 trillion, right? As we try to close that gap. Um, that's a difference if you, uh oh, went too fast. If you look here, of about, uh, you know, 0.2% of GDP growth per year. That if we worked that show closing this gap, we'd all be better off. And that's the thing I think that gets lost in this discussion, right? Obviously, black households would do better, but we as an economy will all do better if we were to work towards closing this gap. Um, let's look at another one here. Um, housing credit, right? If we were to have equal access in housing credit, if we were to have uh, equal access here in education, which is a lot of you folks, we can see a huge difference here. And even more so, um, lending. And this is something I'm gonna talk about uh, in particular, right? Look at what we have here. Uh, an additional, uh -oh, see if I can get my mouse moving here. An additional uh, $13 trillion in business revenue over the next 20, over the last 20 years. 6.1 million jobs created per year. These are the types of things that we all should get behind. Closing this gap is important to all households. And so let's take a look at maybe a way of doing this. Um, maybe we can use economic freedom, right? Uh, maybe economic freedom can help close these gaps and be better off for all of us. So what are we gonna use as a working definition of economic freedom? We're gonna use this one by Gwartney et al. It's a, pretty, it's a pr fairly standard one. It says individuals have economic freedom when A, property they acquire without the use of force, fraud or theft is protected from physical invasions by others. And B, they are free to use, exchange, or give away their property as long as their actions do not violate the identical rights of others. And that's a noble ideal, right? That I'm able to hold on to the property I'm, I possess and I'm able to engage in free exchange with it, um, with others, as long as, you know, my exchanging of these properties, uh oh, got ahead again, sorry. Um, as long as exchanging these properties don't impinge on anyone else. And for a long time, that's all it was. It was just an ideal. But more recently, um, these same folks 
have been able to functionalize this. And now it's not just an ideal, it is something that we can actually apply numbers to. And once we're able to apply numbers to it, um, we're actually able to do some types of measurement. Now, initially, when, when this in the economic freedom index came up, uh, these guys were thinking about it at the country level. Okay, great. And later, they were able to apply these same uh, metrics, the same functionalization down to the um, state level. And that's what we're going to talk about. So I'm not going to just talk about economic freedom. I'm going to talk about economic freedom of North America. And so let's take a look. So that's what this stands for, the EFNA index is the economic freedom of North America index. And so it's divided into three components. And they say that a state, now remember, we're going to do this at the state level. Um, a state is more economically free if they abide by the principles that we have here, the measurements that they have here. For instance, uh, the size of government. They're going to say that the general consumption expenditures by government as a percentage of GDP should be small. Basically, right, the government should not be the leading purchaser of goods and products. And so if we look at that as a percentage of GDP, when that's smaller, that means that a state is more economically free. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with this index, but it is an index that we can all use. And that's what the benefit of it is. Okay, um, transfers and subsidies as a percentage of GDP, they're going to say that the smaller the numbers of transfers and subsidies are as a percentage of GDP coming from the government, that's better for economic freedom. Some would argue, well, you know, transfers and subsidies are the things that help out um, those at the lower end of the income distribution. Are you saying that that's better when these numbers are smaller? Well, that's what this index would, would say. Social security payments as a percentage of GDP, smaller social security payments, better your economic freedom measure. Uh, takings and discriminatory taxation, number two, right? We did number one size of government, number two, takings and discriminatory taxation. Okay. Total tax revenue as a percentage of GDP. They're gonna argue in this index that if that number is smaller, the total takings, right? The total tax revenue as a percentage of GDP, if that's smaller, your state is more economically free. The top marginal tax rate and the income threshold at which it applies, once again, you're getting the, the, the idea. The smaller that number is, or the lower that number is, um, the more economically free your state is, indirect tax revenue as a percentage of GDP, you get the idea, sales tax collected as a percentage of GDP, you get the idea. Smaller taxes, smaller taxes means that the state is more economically free. Okay, so those are the two. We've got the size of government, we've got takings and discriminatory taxation, and finally, we've got labor market freedom, as they describe it, which would say the minimum wage. And as most of you econ folks know, or maybe everybody, minimum wage has been in the news as of late. As of January 1, many, many states uh, increased. Oops, sorry, got to get myself again. Uh, many, many states just increased their state minimum wage. The federal minimum wage hasn't been increased. Uh, since 2009. So um, there's talk of even that being moved up. But for our purposes today, minimum wage legislation, the, the least amount of minimum wage legislation you have, more economic freedom, government employment as a percentage of total state provincial employment. Obviously, they're saying that if states employ fewer employees and those employees are then out in the private sector working uh, better for 
uh, economic freedom, and finally, union density. Now, they're going to argue that um, lower amounts of union density translates into more economic freedom. So they're going to be anti-union um, here. OK, so those are the three, right? Let's go back and take a look and make sure we got them. Size of government, they want it smaller. Takings and discriminatory taxation, they want it smaller. Uh, labor market freedom, they want these areas smaller. And if your state, if you take all of these different metrics and you put them together and you measure them, um, then you have a state that's economically free. And don't lose track of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to see that if a state is very good at what is called for in this economic freedom of North America index, is that good for closing that gap, right? The income gap that we talked about before, the income and the wealth gap, basically the racial gap. So let's, uh, let's keep digging and see. Now, here's some, some stuff for those of you who care about some of the more technical details that are going on here. We're going to get the data that um, I mentioned before, the economic freedom data. We're going to get them off of census years. Uh, we had them for 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2010. We're going to use a uh, real median income, right? Um, as you saw listed in the chart before, we're going to use the economic freedom of North America index, and they give you that stuff. So we have that. We're going to throw in some other control variables. And for those of you who care about the econometric setup, uh, we're going to use a panel data model. So before we dig into it, let's just look at some, some graphs. And let's just goof around a little bit and look at a couple of graphs. Now, here's one. Here's an interesting one here. We're looking at economic freedom uh, as measured along here. And I should note that that index goes from 0 to 10. So if, you, if your state is 10, your state has the absolute most uh, economic freedom. You are hitting on all cylinders according to that index I showed you before. You're at the top of the top. Uh, if you're at zero, then that means that you're not doing very good on any of those indexes. Um, along the, or the, the vertical axis here, we're going to look at real black household income. That's the thing I was telling you about before. And what it looks like is that as economic freedom goes up, as a state's economic freedom goes up, so does real black household income. But be very, very careful here because this is a truncated graph and this line you see going through here, which we would call a trend line, is actually exaggerated. Um, but it does give us something graphical to take a look at. Hmm. It does look to us like economic freedom going up uh, real black household income going up. Maybe we're on to something here. Well, hold on. Let's let's keep going and take a look. Let's do the same thing for whites. Um, same thing, right? Uh, even a little bit more pronounced here that white income is actually starting at a higher level than it was for black income. But we knew that was going to be the case because we saw that uh, in the graphics I gave you earlier. Uh oh, let me go back there. I don't know why this thing keeps trying to jump ahead. But um, here is here is the white income. Here is freedom, economic freedom. Oh, okay. Uh, even more pronounced, right? So let's do this. Let's look at the ratio, right? Let's look at the ratio of black to white income and see what we get. Uh, not so hot, not so hot. So what we're measuring here is the gap. In other words, the black to white income gap. And what it seems to be showing here is that as economic freedom is going up, right, <clears throat> the ratio of black to white incomes is actually going down, meaning that 
they're actually spreading more. Uh, that's not what we would have wanted, right? We would have wanted to see the gap closing. Now, let's be clear and let's, there's, there's a couple of ways that a gap between two lines can actually expand. One thing that can happen is one line at the bottom is sort of flat and the other line is going up. That's obviously going to be a gap. Um, the line at the bottom could be going up, but the line at the top could be going up more. And so you say, hey, they're both going up, but if the one at the top is shooting up way more, you're still going to have an increase in the gap. And obviously, um, if one is going down and the other one's going up, then that's going to do nothing but exacerbate the gap. So something's going on here because what we would have liked to have seen is that this gap would have been decreasing. But here's the problem. Uh, this, what we're doing here, is just looking at a couple of plotted graphs we probably want to be a little bit more um, scientific about it. And we are. So here's what I've done here is, here's a table which has the results of that analysis I was telling you about before, uh, the regression analysis. And I didn't wanna bore you with all the graphs and stuff, but out of that panel data analysis that we had done earlier, um, you can see the results. And here are all the components we just talked about before. Here are all the components of economic freedom. And here is their impact on black. And here is their impact on white. And here is their impact on the gap between black and white. Um, and we have to be careful here in that <clears throat> um, the way that we read this one, because this one is a ratio, and not to go too far into, you know, um, ninth grade, um, you know, ninth grade mathematics. But remember, when you have a fraction here and the denominator is growing bigger than the numerator, you're gonna end up with a smaller number, right? And so, and the denominator here is white income and the numerator is black income. And so when you see a negative here, that's not a good thing. So let's, let's just look at this overall and let's see if this is making sense to you. So we'll just go through a few and hopefully um, we'll be able to dig it out. So here's the entire economic freedom index, right? What is the impact? of economic freedom on black median household income. Uh, basically, when you see that zero here, it is not statistically significant. So if you were to believe firmly in the tenets of economic freedom, um, it is having no impact, not a positive impact on black household income, but not a negative impact on uh, black household income. However, uh, for whites, it has a statistically significant uh, positive impact on white household income. And I'll talk about some of these components in a bit, and we'll see why that might necessarily be the case. So what's the impact on the black-white gap? It is not helping, right? So basically what you're going to see here is happening is the gap is widening because whites are being helped and blacks are not being hurt, right? And so um, economic freedom overall isn't what we thought it would be if we thought that we could use this definition of economic freedom to help close the gap. Uh, that's not happening here. Let's look at some of the components here um, and see why that would be the case. Let's look at this one in particular, because this one to me, 1B is always one that I find interesting. Transfers and subsidies. So transfers and subsidies are going to be exactly as it sounds, you know, if you think about um, 
you're going to have some amount of transfers going from people at the top of the income distribution to people at the bottom of the income distribution. And if we look here, um, making that smaller actually helps white households. And that's not surprising since white households had more income and more wealth to start with if we believed in making transfers and subsidies smaller that meant that less of white income and wealth would have been transferred to the lower ends of the income distribution so as a result what do we see here um blacks are not helped uh and not hurt whites are helped no good uh, as far as if we wanted to use this as a policy prescription. How about this one? Uh, government consumption expenditures. Um, this one actually hurts. Hurts black. Um, helps white. Not a good one. So basically what you want to do here is you want to look down here and you want to see a plus, right? That's where you want to see a plus. And anywhere you see a plus, you would say, hey, all right, this particular aspect of economic freedom is helping to close the gap, right? Um, that would mean that the numerator, black, black household wealth income was growing faster than white household wealth income. And we don't see that for any of those. At best, we have some with a couple of zeros, meaning neutrals, and um, and then we got a bunch of negatives here. And so people always ask me about this one right here. And so let's talk about minimum wage legislation. You're saying, hey, how in the world is it possible that this one can be positive and this one can be positive, yet this one is negative? Well, that's what I was mentioning to you before that yes, these are both positive, but the increases for whites are just faster than they were for blacks, even though they both were benefiting from it. And that actually ended up causing this to be a negative number also. So um, what can we draw as conclusions in that we have seen um, that the gaps exist, the gaps exist both in terms of income and in terms of wealth. And we thought maybe we could use economic freedom or at least this measure of economic freedom as a way to help close that gap. Um, we're not seeing it. Uh-oh, I went ahead again. Sorry about that, folks. All right, let me see here. All right, so we didn't get what we expected, but you know that's why you do the work. Right, you do the work so that um, you can see what the end results are. So, as a policy prescription, I would not be in favor of using this definition of economic freedom and pushing for more of these types of policies if it were my goal to try to make that a positive number. If I wanted to make that a positive number, I would not use economic freedom or the economic freedom of North America index as a policy prescription. So then you would say, well, how about some of the various components? Would you use any of the components? Maybe we don't use the entire index, but maybe we just use some of the components. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say no, right? Look at look at what you got here. At best, they aren't they aren't hurting, but none of these are really um, turning up positive. So I'm gonna say no, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that this one has a policy prescription. Now remember, one of the students saying that they were studying public public policy as a public policy prescription towards closing the income and wealth gap, racial income and wealth gap, I'm gonna say that this one is not gonna be a policy prescription that I'm going to subscribe to. 
And I see that uh, time's getting away. So let's do another one. Let's look more in depth at, at what economic freedom said. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to switch gears now. And we're going to talk about banking. And here's the question. Is there a relationship between state banking deregulation and state income inequality? If banking deregulation matters for inequality, what aspects of deregulation matter, right? And what about inequality? So here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to date myself and just show exactly how old I am. And I'm gonna to explain to you what's going on here. There was a time in the US when a bank only had one branch, right? Um, you couldn't go to this branch of Bank of America or Wells Fargo or go you know, down the street and go to that branch of Bank of America. Um, there was only one bank, right? And that was it. And if you didn't bank at that bank, uh, you had no chance to go to another one. In fact, there was no, that's what we call branch banking, right? So, you know, you could go to this branch of Wells Fargo, and if you didn't want to go there, you could go to the one down the street or to the other one. Mm -mm. There was a time, and um, I'm happy to say that I don't remember exactly this, when branch banking wasn't allowed. I do remember the time before there was ATM. <laughs> yeah, uh, for some of you, you're saying, what, you mean there wasn't always ATMs? No, um, there was a time when if you wanted to use the bank, you actually had to go inside and you had to go to the teller and you had a little book. And this book was used to keep a ledger of how much uh, money you had in your account. And uh, it was called a bank book. So I'm not quite old enough to remember the time when we didn't have branch banking, but I am old enough to remember a time when we didn't have um, uh, uh, ATMs and you had to go inside. And let me take that one step further for you. Not only were there no branches inside of the state, there was a time when there weren't any branches across states, right? So here in Oklahoma, where I am now, uh, we have branches of Bank of America and Bank of America is in many, many states. But that wasn't always the case. It wasn't always the case that you had banking that crossed state lines. In fact, there wasn't banks even in the same city. You only had that one branch and you didn't have others. So the question came up when regulators start saying, you know what, we need to allow banks to have branches because we think that branch banking will help to decrease income inequality. Um, some said, don't do this. Having a bank that has more than one branch will not only not decrease income inequality, wealth inequality, it's going to increase that. Let's look at some of the arguments. So here is what some people would say when they said, hey, you know what? If you allow this branch banking, you're going to increase inequality. So I'm going to read some of this. The idea that branch banking might limit loans to small borrowers is new and is one reason why branch banking restrictions persisted into the late 20th century in much of the United States. For example, in 1902, Charles G. Daw, the former comptroller of the currency, argued that the tendency of branch, branch, branch banks would be to curtail the number of small loans where personality and character are elements in the consideration of loan applications by the loan or banker. The man, in other words, who goes to work in the fields of undeveloped resources 
isn't this really some 1902 language? Anyway, uh, undeveloped resources is the very one whose credit is to be curtailed and his chance to found or increase a business injured by the branch banking system. In this country, we are, are leading the world commercially because under our law and government, we have made it our special effort to protect the rights, interests, and opportunities of the individual and of the small enterprise. So, okay, that's a, that's a mouthful. So here's what they're saying. They're saying that the reason why you don't want to have branch, branch, branch banks is right now, the banker is my neighbor and I know the neighbor and this is a local bank. It is a bank in my community. I know that banker. If you let some bank across town or across state or even across the, across the country open up a branch, there is no relationship. They don't know me. They're just some people out trying to make a buck. And if you let these banks just go wherever they want, crossing state lines, crossing city lines, that intimacy is lost. And if that intimacy is lost, the person that's going to be hurt is the small enterprise, as he says, or the individual or the small enterprise. And so there was a, a great deal of consternation about this idea of allowing branch banks. Um, and so what they're saying is, look, you know, what's going to happen here is these branches are going to come in, they're going to cater to the high income people, they're going to not help at all the low income people, the low income people who already have very little access to banking services will be worse off. Okay, that's the more inequality view. Let's look at the less inequality view. Okay, um, if the poor segments of society have been constrained and unable to borrow for productive activities like education and entrepreneurial opportunities, then financial development, branch banking, may open up access to credit, allowing the poor access to opportunities then one would expect the poor to be better economically. So the other argument is this. Um, look, once you allow branch banking, banks have to compete against each other. And therefore, they're going to not just look at the very top of the income distribution, they're gonna look at people at the bottom of the income distribution, and they're going to say, hey, you know what? This person looks like a sound risk, and I have to generate revenues. And this might actually be good for the poor if we allowed branch banking. Um, now, what if that local banker didn't like me? Or what if that local banker didn't like the color of my skin, right? Then I was out of luck because that local banker was all there was. However, if we start allowing competition, this might actually work out pretty well for us. Okay, let's take a look here. What we see here is this is 2016 median liquid assets. And what do we mean by liquid assets? Liquid assets include transactions accounts, bank accounts, uh, certificates of deposits, and some other stuff. So, um, white household, white household uh, liquid assets being held, right? More than double that of uh, black households liquid assets and Hispanics, right? Over triple. So what are we saying here? Um, some segments of the community are underbanked. And that's a term we would use. We would say, look, they're underbanked. And remember, some things I just can't say for, right? And so therefore, I need to have access to banking services. I need to have access to, if I want to buy a car or a house, I'm going to need to have a banker that's going to need to be willing to make a loan to me. I cannot save enough money to buy a house, right? I'm going to need to have banking services available to me. And 
Maybe these branch banks are the way we go about it. Okay, um, so now you see the problem, which we, we're talking about, we're trying to close that gap. We're trying to close some of this gap and maybe this branch banking idea uh, will help us out. Okay, um, what's the setup for this one look like? We're gonna use income inequality data created from a Frank 2014 self-constructed data set. I know, I know, don't really worry too much about that. We're going to use annual uh, data from the period 1970 to 2000, because that's the period over which all of this direct deregulation was taking place. And we're gonna use a panel approach, which is a system GMM. Um, all of that is the technical, that's as far as the technical stuff's going to go. Um, that is what we use to create the results. So let's take a look. All right, I'm running a little bit behind. Um, let's take a look. I use two different measures of inequality. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this. I mean, there's a typo in there. That should say Jeannie, not Jenny. Um, it should be like this one, Jenny. I'm looking at it in terms of its growth, right? The growth in inequality. This is inequality, right? So this is the amount of inequality and this is growth in inequality. And here's what we found that if you looked at branch, branch banking alone, we saw that inequality grew. We saw that the growth in inequality grew. So the first guy was right, right? Remember the two arguments? Um, one said, hey, you know, this is going to help to close inequality. And one said it was going to increase inequality. Well, it actually, surprise, surprise, it actually ended up both in levels and in growth rates, we saw that um, both of them increased under branch banking. What about uh, deregulation along with controlling for income growth? Still, the level of inequality increased, the growth rate in inequality increased. What about the regulation when you hold into account unemployment? Still, the regulation uh, caused an increase in the, in the level and in the growth rate. Finally, what if we threw everything in it? Regulation, income growth, and unemployment all accounted for using some of those econometric tools. What do we see? Uh, still, an increase in the level of inequality and an increase in the growth rate in inequality. Um, yeah, that's what happened. So what can, how can we summarize this result? We can say based on both the Gini coefficient of poverty, that's the Gini measure of poverty and the Teal measure, that's one I didn't do. I didn't show you that one because the results were exactly the same. But these are two different ways you can measure uh, inequality. Um, the results do not provide any evidence that banking deregulation reduced income inequality at the state level. In fact, we find consistent evidence that the opposite effect seems to be true and that financial deregulation was associated with increases in inequality. Now, let me be totally honest and upfront with you. Before I started doing this work, I did not anticipate that these would be the results, right? Um, I actually thought it was going to go the other way. And that's exactly why we do the work. We do the work to see where the results are going. I just finished a paper the other day where um, I did exactly the same thing, but instead of doing it inequality, what you see here, um, um, I did it, the black-white difference. Remember the one we saw before? I looked at the difference in black-white under bank, banking deregulation. And you can already guess what I found, right? Was I found the same thing here, that when you look at deregulation, 
um, it did not decrease the black-white ratio. It actually increased it. Didn't see that coming, uh, to be quite honest with you. Didn't see this result coming and didn't see the black-white one coming either. I'm out of time. Uh, I am, uh, I think I'm one minute and 40 seconds over my allotted time and I apologize for that, but I talk too much. Uh, I'm ready to listen. So let me stop my share. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we're gonna move on to some questions and answers from our audience now. The first one comes from an alum who's wondering if there are any cost-effective uh, policy solutions you know of that do work to reduce the wealth gap between black and white Americans, and particularly whether low cost ones like a technical job training program or financial literacy assistance might be helpful. All right, well, there's a couple of things that actually um, work fairly well, right? Um, when you want to close the gap, we need to have better access to certain types of training. Um, and those are low cost because we already have the infrastructure built for that. Um, the United States isn't much of a, isn't a big proponent of a community college system. I am. Um, a community college system works or better yet, an apprenticeship system, right? Where we get people into jobs. Um, that's the key to closing the gap so that people get income and then they can use that towards uh, intergenerational wealth transfers. Um, we already got the infrastructure. We don't support it and we um, don't use it much, but that's just one example of many that I'm a proponent of. I would like to see us move much more towards training, uh, on the job training, and I would like us to use our already existing community college system. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, California has an absolute goo gob of community college, right? You have a very extensive community college system there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's true. So anyway, um, I think that's a good, a good start. Next question um, asks, why is it that according to the Economic Freedom Index, transfers do not help Black Americans who are disproportionately low income? Um, let me, that they don't help? No, it was the case that transfers do help. What the chart showed was that when you make the level of transfer smaller, that hurts Black Americans. All right, so that's what the chart's showing. Remember, the Economic Freedom Index says what you want to do is decrease transfers as much as you possibly can. Since Black Americans are disproportionately recipient of transfers, then decreasing them puts an extra onus on them. And maybe that chart wasn't clear, but that's what um, you should take away. Remember what Economic Freedom says. Economic freedom says in all of those aspects, the less of this you do, the better, right? The less union, the less taxes, the less, right, of this. And so less transfers is not beneficial for Black Americans. Our next question is whether uh, in calculating the Black, White, median household income, the number of wage earners in the household and the age of those wage earners in the household was taken into account. Yeah, well, that's what you get when you do household income. So, um, and I don't want to go into a, a lot of details, but household income is different from family income. So household income is going to count every wage earner over 16 in that household, whether they're related or not. So two um, cohabitating individuals would be considered for household income where that, where that would not be the case for family income. So you, can, you count all um, wage earners over the age of 16. That's, that's pretty standard econ stuff that you find in the census, but. 
Um, a parent would like to know, does your research imply that actually reducing economic freedom, quote unquote, helps um, Black Americans? Reducing economic, oh, I get it. I don't think so. I think what it does is I don't think that it, it helps or it hurts, right? I think most of those numbers show that economic freedom is sort of uh, in, in, insensitive to the Black um, the black household income. So um, reducing it probably th there's, look, let's say that you got a gap and you want to reduce this gap. There's two ways you could go about it, right? You could either take this, the bottom part, and you could try and bring it up, or you could take the top part and you could try and bring it down. I think that by reducing economic freedom, what you ended up doing is you're bringing this top part down. And that's not good for any of us, right? What, what we really want to do is come up with a strategy where this thing's going up and this is going up and we close the gap by both of them moving up. Um, any strategy that causes a decrease in white household income to close the gap um, is probably inefficient. We want to raise black household income. Continuing on that same topic, our next question is whether you think that uh, policies that have a positive effect on both groups' incomes, but that nonetheless increase the gap by increasing white incomes more are still worthwhile to pursue. Um, some are, right? And some aren't. Um, let's say that you, you talk about education, right? We know that returns to education aren't, e aren't even. But you've got to look at the short runs and the long run impacts of these. There's no way that we can't say that education is a policy that isn't beneficial for all Americans ultimately. So um, what do I think about uh, some of the components of economic freedom? I'm gonna say, I think we could, we could do without some of those, but overall, most policies I think are, are even if the net gains initially go more to those at the top, the key is to get more Blacks into the top of the income distribution. Could you discuss the um, result that you found for the minimum wage aspect of economic freedom? What implications does this have for the policy discussion about raising the minimum wage? Um, now, remember, this work was done before this current wave of minimum wages um, took place. So this work is, a, is going to predate that one. So what I'm really giving you is not an analysis of that work, but my prediction of what are going to happen. I predict that the, the, if we were to go to the, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about the $15 minimum wage, um, that we should see some closing of the gaps in certain parts of the country. The problems we have is that, as you know, our, the cost of living in rural Mississippi is not the same as the cost of living in the Bronx. So we're not going to see even benefits across the spectrum. And that's where things get complicated with the $15 minimum wage. Um, $15 in rural Mississippi is an entirely different animal than it's going to be, you know, um, in South Chicago where I grew up. So um, I, I need to look at it at, at the regional level, not even at the state level, because we know even at the state level, it wouldn't necessarily be even. I'd want to look at it at the region level and then say, here is where we target the the minimum wage, right? We need to, I think we need to more so target if we really want to be effective than um, an overall increase. But we do need to increase it overall, but just not at the same amount. What I would like to see instead of a $15, uh, let's say 15%, I'm just making that number up, but a percentage increase across regions makes more sense to me than a flat dollar amount. Beyond just the support for apprenticeship and community college that you talked about, do you think there are any policies uh, also other than the minimum wage that might be worthwhile in the discussion of coronavirus recovery and stimulus bill that's upcoming that could help to reduce the racial wealth gap? 
Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things we need to do is that the, the small business loan um, aspect is just being totally uh, missed here. Here's an opportunity we have right now to put just an enormous amount of people back into the workforce, right? Our labor force participation rate, and I don't want to go into the weeds with all of this um, technical stuff, but our labor force participation rate are not nearly high enough to where we have to worry about any type of inflationary pressures. So therefore, um, as we try to recover from this, I would say the best thing we could do is, especially for small black entrepreneurs, which we just had um, a discussion at the White House about um, maybe two days ago, that to me seems to be an area of prime for closing the gap. Right, because the one thing we know about smaller black owned businesses is that they're in black communities. Those, the multiplier effect of those dollars could be tremendous for us. We could do a lot of good work with that. Sorry for running on with that answer. Thank you for um, answering all the questions of the audience, um, but to give you the final few minutes to give any closing thoughts. My closing thoughts are that we still have work to do. Um, I like doing this type of research because even at this stage in my career, I'm still surprised, right? I'm, I still wake up every day and I'm looking for results and I'm surprised. I was absolutely surprised about the deregulation thing, right? I, as I told you before, I didn't see that coming. So what I would like to see uh, us do is more of the same. I would like to see you folks. I think a couple of you are PPE majors. Um, I want to see you pick up the mantle and do this type of work. And finally, I'd just like to thank you for thinking of me for this opportunity, even though it's virtual and uh, I didn't get to enjoy um, California hospitality. I, I understand that when these things are in person, um, you get a meal with these. And all I had was what I was regularly having for dinner. So um, I want my meal. Anyway, so <laughs> thanks a lot, folks. I really appreciate having the time to chat with you. And you can find all of that stuff, all of those, um, all of those papers I'm, I referenced and all that stuff is on my website. Feel free to look me up, Gary Hoover at Tulane University, and you can have access to all of that, all of the research and down to the numbers. Thank you very much. We appreciate it having you. Um, and on behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to you, Professor Hoover, and to all those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual ATH event, which will be on Wednesday, February 10th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Aurora C. Elmore will speak on the consequences of climate change at Mount Everest. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>